Just one year ago, we withdrew out of Afghanistan in August of last year. After promises to our citizens that were in that country and to the many Afghans who helped us with our work there in that country, the promises that they would not be abandoned, the promises that we would leave no one behind. On August the 30th of last year, the last plane lifting people out of Afghanistan left the airport, leaving behind hundreds of US citizens and thousands of Afghan citizens who had risked their lives for us over there with the assurance that we would protect them, leaving them behind to face the Taliban. Many of those that were left behind had traveled that day on, on very dangerous roads, roads controlled by Taliban patrols. They had made their way through all those dangers to the airport itself and they were standing outside the fence, desperately pleading to be let in to the airport so that they could escape the country. Meanwhile, the security of the airport had been turned over to the Taliban. And so instead of letting them in, some of them were shot and killed just outside those fences. And those poor people had to watch those planes take off and return to their homes, knowing that the Taliban had promised to wipe out every US citizen and every ally in the country. That's not the end of the story, though. For months after that, when the US would no longer go in to rescue its citizens, Christian organizations in the United States were raising money to hire private planes with brave pilots to fly back into that country. They were doing the undercover work of finding, locating the American families that were still left and our allies that were still left and trying to get them to the airport on a certain day when they could load those planes up with people and take them out. They had assurances that they would be able to land in the United States until the planes were loaded with the people. And then suddenly the State Department said they could not land anywhere in the United States. So at the last minute, these Christian organizers that had been trying to get people out had been making all these efforts, spent all this money, had risked their own lives to do this, were scrambling around trying to find a country that would take them. They talked to all our allies and some of even our, you know, iffy allies, trying to find somebody that would take these planes of U.S. citizens so that they could get out of that dangerous country. While they sat on the tarmac in the hot Afghanistan sun, our State Department was contacting those same countries, putting pressure on them not to receive those flights. At the end of that day, most of the people had to return to the places that they had been living under the sentence of death of the Taliban. These people who had placed their faith in the United States that they would not be left behind, those Afghan citizens who had risked their lives for so long doing all that we needed for them to do on the ground at a cost of the danger of their lives, they had their faith disappointed in the United States at that time. I'm reminded this morning, sadly, that not everything is worthy of our faith. And if we place our faith in the wrong things, it could be disastrous. But this morning, we would point to the essential faith 
Though we must have in him who will not forsake us, who will not leave us behind, who will not leave us to fend for ourselves. Our text for this morning is Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, where we find the writer of Hebrews writing this. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. I'd like to talk with you this morning, first of all, about what faith is, because there's some people who don't seem to understand what real faith is. There's a whole lot of people in the Christian community today, in this country and even around the world, that see faith as a simple belief. Those who promote that simple belief idea of faith says that that simple belief that Jesus is the Christ is enough to save them regardless of what they do with their lives. Don't have to attend church, don't have to live a godly life, don't have to do any works for the Lord. You know, it's just enough that they have this simple belief in him. They call that faith. Oh, it'd be nice if they wanted to do more. It'd be nice if they'd volunteer their time, if they would expend the effort to do more for the kingdom of God, but that's not necessary for their salvation. You know something? That's not what God's word says that faith is. In James chapter 2, verses 17 and 18, it says, Even so, faith, if it has no works, is dead, being by itself. But someone may well say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without the works. And I will show you my faith by my works. The difference between what they call faith in that simple belief and what the Bible describes as faith is that faith is trusting God with our lives. It's believing enough that we invest ourselves in what we believe. The idea that we could have real faith and never be seen in the way that we live our lives, well, that can't be real faith, according to God's word. Jesus' teaching was plain on this as well. Remember what Jesus said of his picture of that uh, judgment day? He says, many people on that day will say to me, Lord, Lord, they will claim to have a relationship to me as their Lord. He says, and I'm going to look at them and say, I never knew you. See, they had a simple belief that Jesus was who he claimed to be. But what does Jesus say was lacking? I was hungry and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me nothing to drink. I was naked and you didn't clothe me. I was in prison and you never came to visit me. I was a stranger and you did not take me in. And, and these people that the Lord's telling them they have no relationship to them, they said, when did we do this to you, Lord? And he said, when you did it, did not do this to the least of these, my brethren. You failed to do it for me. What's Jesus saying there? He's not saying our salvation is a matter of works. It is an issue of faith. But he's saying genuine faith shows up in your life. It shows up in what you do. It shows up in how you live. And you can't have a genuine faith if it never shows up. If it never is shown in what you say and what you do. That's not the only teaching Jesus had on this. He also taught that his believers would be recognized by their fruits, by what they were producing with their life. Those people who had a relationship with him would be recognizable because of what they were doing. Were they saved because of what they're doing? No, absolutely not. You can't earn your way into heaven. But you can't have a genuine faith 
without it showing up in your life in what you do day in and day out. Real faith, as James was pointing out, real faith shows up in our actions. Faith is not simple belief. Now, other people make the mistake about the nature of faith when they think of faith as, a, as an irrational gamble. You know, it doesn't really make any sense, but I'm going to put all my chips on this one. That's the way a lot of people see as faith. It doesn't make any sense, but this is what I prefer to believe, so this is what I'm going to believe. They talk about a blind faith, or they talk about a leap of faith. There's no basis for one's faith, but they toss out all reason to cling to what makes no sense to them. That's what they see as faith. But by that irrational faith, some churches, not very many, mind you, I can't imagine this being a popular thing to draw people in, but some churches pass around rattlesnakes during the service. Nothing rational in that. But you see, faith. They're going to express it in irrational ways. Individuals do harmful things with that irrational faith. And yet, let me point out to you something. The Bible is not irrational. One of the problems we have communicating God's word in society today is that we've moved from a rational-based society to one which is based on feelings. And it no, matter, no longer matters what truth is. Truth is what you feel in your heart. And in that kind of, of mindset, the Bible doesn't have any authority unless it agrees with what you're feeling inside. But the Bible's very rational, very reasonable. It is not based on mindless supposition. It uses reason, and irrational faiths usually lead away from the plain truth of God's word to strange and twisted interpretations of that word. Now, our text this morning tells us what real faith is. I'd like for you to look at another version of the same text that we read earlier. It's in something called the Amplified Bible, which is sort of the... Bible that tries to explain everything in the English language by going back to the Greek and looking what the inference there is in the Greek and then expanding what the English says about it. So this is the way the Amplified Bible writes this passage. Now faith is the assurance, title deed, confirmation of things hoped for, divinely guaranteed and the evidence of things not seen, the conviction of their reality. Faith comprehends as fact that which cannot be experienced by the physical senses. Now you see what the Amplified Bible is doing there. It's telling us that what this verse is communicating to us is not an irrational supposition that we believe without seeing. What it's doing here is to take the actual meanings of the Greek words and put them in an explanation form of a verse so that we see that the text is saying that faith is the solid conviction that what God has promised is true even when we have yet to see it. That's not irrational. When we come to know God, when we've realize what his word says is true, then we can believe those parts of the word where God has promised something which has not yet happened. We haven't seen it with our eyes, but we have this conviction that what God says is true and we hold it as a reality even though we haven't seen it yet. That's what our passage is saying. It's not some blind faith. It's not some leap of faith that we're talking about here. It is the conviction based upon our certainty in the Lord that he is reliable 
and we can trust him with our future, with what we have yet to see with our eyes. We place that kind of conviction in many things in our daily life. When you get in the car and drive someplace, you're putting your faith in the idea that that car is going to get you there. I've had many cars which disappointed that faith <laughs> through the years. We get on an airplane. We don't expect it to go down before we arrive at our destination. If we really thought that was a possibility, we wouldn't get on that airplane. But we have faith that's going to take us to where we're going, even though we haven't seen it yet. You see, we have that kind of faith in our lives over many lesser things. But what God's word says is, that's the conviction that we're supposed to have to live our lives about what God says will be. Haven't seen it yet, but we know this with certainty. Our God is absolutely reliable, and we live our lives invested in that truth. It would not be faith if we only trusted what we could see. As 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7 says, we walk by faith, not by sight. That's what faith is. Trust in God. Investing in God based on our conviction of what he has told us. Now, one other thing I wanted to cover this morning, and that's this. How faith helps us. What is the practical aspect of having faith in our lives? What does faith do for us in our daily walk? Well, first of all, the Bible tells us faith helps us to be pleasing to God. In Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6, And without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who seek him. We go to Hebrews chapter 10, verses 38 and 39. We find this testimony. Here's the words of God. But my righteous one shall live by faith. And if he shrinks back, my soul has no pleasure in him. The writer of Hebrews goes on and then says, but we are not of those who shrink back to destruction, but of those who have faith to the persevering of the soul. Only by faith can a person be in a close fellowship with God. Again, without faith, it is impossible to please him. We cannot have a relationship with God unless we trust him absolutely with our lives. And he will not tolerate those who are waver and are unsure in their walk with him. So faith helps us to be close to God. The second thing faith does for us, faith helps us to live victoriously in this world. You see those Bible passages talking about our triumph, talking about our victory. We are to live exceedingly victorious through Christ. You can't live an overcoming life if you're straddling the fence. You cannot live a life which accomplishes what God wants to accomplish in your life if you're kind of, sort of, convicted that maybe he is telling you the truth. It takes faith to be able to live victoriously. And you aren't going to live life well in this world if you're being taken down by the enemy. We have an enemy. One who is like, the Bible says, a roaring lion, which is on the prowl, seeking to destroy us. We have an adversary in Satan who wants to destroy our faith, and he's looking to destroy us. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 9. 
The Apostle Peter says, but resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same experiences of your suffering are being accomplished by your brethren who are in the world. Standing in resistance to the enemy by our faith. Faith gets us through this world, and not just barely, but it gets us through this world victoriously. Finally, one other thing I want you to see about what faith does for us, and that's this. Faith leads us to our heavenly home. Again, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 9. Obtaining as the outcome of your faith the salvation of your souls. That's why we see the emphasis in God's word on being faithful unto death. Real faith is not just starting well. It is that which takes us the whole way. Consider Peter walking on the water. You know the story. The disciples of Jesus have gone on ahead. They're in the middle of the Sea of Galilee. They're not making much progress against the storm. And suddenly they see this shadowy figure that looks like a man walking on the surface of the water towards them. And they're scared to death. They say, this must be a ghost. And then Jesus calls out to them. And they know that it's Jesus walking on the water to them. Now, of the disciples in that boat on that day, only one of them wanted to get out of the safety of the boat and walk across the water to Jesus. And Peter asked for permission to do that. Can I come to you, Lord? Can I walk out to you? And Jesus says, yes. And Peter steps out of the boat on the water. This man who had been fishing these waters all of his life suddenly believed that the, he could walk on the surface of the waters to Jesus by the power of Jesus. And he begins to walk toward Jesus, and what happens? He starts noticing the storm around him. He becomes overcome with fear, and he starts to sink. And what is Jesus' response to him? What does Jesus say to him? You of little faith. Why did you doubt? Little faith? Peter had been the only one that wanted to step out of the boat on the water in the first place. Of all the disciples there on that day, Peter was the only one who trusted the Lord enough to step out on the water. That seems like faith, doesn't it? But Jesus says, you of little faith. Because even though Peter started well, he allowed the faith to dwindle in him. It did not go the whole way. And that's what Jesus was saying when he told Peter, you have little faith. Your faith didn't take you far enough. It's all well and good to get a good start. But the goal of faith is take, to take us to the end. You just move to a new town. You have a friend that's already living in that town. But as you're driving out on the freeway, your car starts chugging, and it will go no farther. You pull it over to the shoulder. Now, you don't know any of the repair services in this town. You're new to this town. And you can't seem to get internet service here to locate one. So who do you call? You call your friend. And you explain to them your circumstance. And they say, don't worry about it. I'll come out there and I'll pick you up. And the friend leaves to go pick up his friend. Halfway there, he feels hungry. He decides to stop in and get something to eat. And after he's had a full meal, he... Uh, he's feeling a little tired now. So forgetting all about his friend, he goes back home to go to sleep. Was that friend faithful to his friend who was broken down on the side of the road? 
No, because his faith didn't take him all the way. It only took him out the door into his car, and then after that he forgot about what he was doing, and he abandoned his friend. Faith is not about the short burst, it's about going the distance. And many people who are baptized into Christ, they fully intend to live for Jesus, but their spiritual life fades, and they walk away. How sad, because real faith must go the whole way. It takes us to the finish line. It takes us to our heavenly home. In conclusion this morning, it's all about faith. It's trusting in God that makes the most important difference in our lives. So are you ready to step out in faith? By way of invitation this morning, if you'd like to confess Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and obey him in the waters of baptism, if you'd like to renew your commitment to live for him, if you have any decision that you'd like to make public this morning, you're going to have that opportunity. We're going to go into a meditation time where you can think about what God's word has said and you can allow his Holy Spirit to bring conviction on your heart and you can act on that this morning. Let's enter into that invitation time with a word of prayer. Father, we thank you so much for your love. We thank you, Lord, that no matter what we're going through, you are faithful to us. Help us, Lord, to see your worth and respond in faith to you. Help us to go the whole distance, Lord, trusting in you with our lives, living lives on purpose, drawing close to you because of that faith. Now watch over us, Lord, as we go through this time of personal meditation and prayer. And lead those who need to make a decision to come forward at this time. We pray in your son Jesus' name. Amen.